Hey, how are you doing? Listen, I want to begin by thanking Amari and Marcus for the opportunity and the honor of, of being able to talk to you. Okay, I'm an anthropologist. Um, anthropologists are like a man with a hammer. We study one thing, we're obsessed by a single thing, and that thing is culture. And what I want to talk about today is how we've made culture in the past, how the way we've, we make culture has changed, and then to suggest one way of making culture that seems to me promising as a way of addressing the issues that Mike, when Mike was talking about thinking outside of the box, I think this, this new way of making culture called culturematic is one of those ways of getting outside of the box. And it is, I think, as Robin was saying, you know, listen, she was saying, listen, let's get out of this narrow definition of innovation and distribute innovation so everyone's doing it. Uh, so that's my idea is that culturematic is a way of getting outside of two boxes, the conceptual boxes and the, the kind of institutional ones. So, and please, will you let me know, it's an our work in progress, please let's talk at, at you know, coffee and, and at other opportunities through the day. Okay, so the notion here is culturematic and just to, to give you a very rapid kind of review, you know, in the early days culture was something made for elites and we think about this magnificent church, it's, it's truly magnificent, and its magnificence is about sub celebrating the faith, the, the, the Christianity of this institution, but it's also here to celebrate the, the influence of Mr. Rockefeller. Um, and a lot of culture was created for elites uh, by individuals who didn't think of themselves as artists, they lived merely to celebrate other human beings. Moving forward very rapidly in hundreds of years, we come to the 20th century America where we're no longer making culture for elites. We're now making culture, you know, culture is starting to come out of Hollywood in the form of motion pictures, which are designed to speak to millions of people. And indeed, they do speak to millions of people. Uh, and so a great change has taken place. The trouble is uh, not everyone is yet in on the game. Not everybody is making culture. In fact, you go to a Hollywood picture and you are passive, the passive recipient of, of the uh, culture that you see before you. Um, and so what's happened in the last, what, 15 years is a fantastic kind of democratization of the cultural process, of the, of the way of making culture. And we've seen this happen very quickly. Everybody's in on the game, right? Everybody can afford access to the internet. They can afford access to the, uh, the digital tools needed to make culture. So we see everybody in on the game, making culture everywhere, and just this profusion of stuff now. The stats that Robin was giving us for the, uh, the number of videos on YouTube, it's 60 years of, of broadcast. Uh, it's fantastic what we have now accomplished with this, uh, these new tools. We now have new four sources of funding. This is Kickstarter, right? So you can go to Kickstarter and get and round up some funds to make your cultural efforts more, to give them greater scale. And uh, as a result of which, we're now just, it's like the planet has lit up with creativity. Paula, Sk Paula Skurger is the woman who runs the uh, public broadcasting system. She has 350 stations in her system. Uh, only five of them are producing stations, but it's like Paula waking up one morning and discovering every one of those little stations is now producing and TV producing uh, television content doesn't really care much wha about what's coming from the five producing stations. So the thing has just exploded. Oops, there we go. So in all of this, it seemed to me, as an anthropologist studying contemporary culture, it seemed to me I was looking at a, a, a particular category of cultural creativity. And what I like about it is that it really, I think, speaks to what Mike was talking about and what Robin talks about. These culturematics are, are extremely experimental. They're incredibly cheap. They're daring, they're creative, they're often spectacularly uh, successful, and, uh, and it, you can create lots of them. Because they're cheap, you can create lots of them. And I, I think of them a little bit like space probes. You fire them out into the world, it's hard to know what the world wants. It, it's hard to know what's possible. To back to Mike's argument, or wonderful phrase about, uh, about the study of the, what's going on? Um, anyhow, sorry. Um, what was the phrase, Mike? The passion for the possible. 
They're really great for the passion of the possible. And the idea is to try lots of things. Just try and see what happens. Fire these things out into the space and see what comes back. A lot of these pros will just keep going. They won't hit anything, but some of them. So I would argue that reality TV that has transformed American TV, that began as a culture matic. Fantasy football that preoccupies sports fans now is, uh, came from a culture matic. So I began to see culture matic everywhere. I'm going to stand very still. It's like a little experiment. Let's see if we can get this guy to stand still for a moment. It's working! <laughs> <clears throat> Anyhow, I began, to think, I began to see culture matic everywhere, and as I say, I think they're a way to do creativity. So here's an example. This is a guy called Bud Cadell who broke into Mad Men. Mad Men came back online a couple of days ago. My wife Pamela tells me it w wasn't all that great. Uh, but Bud Cadell had a great idea. When, when Mad Men had seized American culture kind of by the throat, when it preoccupied people extraordinarily, Bud said, geez, uh, I can break into Mad Men for the price of a Twitter account, which is to say I can make myself part of Mad Men for free. So he began tweeting in the voice of a guy in the mailroom of the TV show Mad Men. <laughs> good or good? I mean, just perfect. So now, you know, if you're on Twitter, you can get a stream of tweets from a guy who's in the mailroom, and he sees some of the people you see every week on the TV show, and not only does he see them and report on what they're doing in the hallways that you don't get to see in the show, he's reading their mail and letting you know what they really think about one another. It's incredibly clever. What's great about it is that it's free. Cost him absolutely nothing to do, just an act of creativity, an act of imagination. Made him an internet celebrity almost overnight. Uh, here's another example. Oops. So these guys created a bar in downtown Manhattan called Employees Only. And the idea here was to be part of the mixology revolution that's been taking place over the last 10 years. And their notion was, let's create a bar and let's be careful not to tell anybody about it. Let's keep it a complete secret. And let's make sure that even if somebody happens by, literally walks by the bar and looks at it, let's make sure they don't come in. So that's why they put employees only on the door, so no one would come in. It's completely counterintuitive. You think about the logic of capitalism, logic of capitalism is to get a drum and to beat it as loudly and as often as you can until the world knows what it is you're doing. These guys wanted to keep their bar a secret. And with this counterintuitive gesture, they created something that electrified Manhattan. It's like, have you heard of anyone? You know, people in New York live to be the person who knows something before somebody else. And everybody who knew about this had to tell their friends, because it was fantastically interesting. And, uh, and as it turns out, fantastically successful. So their kids in, uh, shoot, their kids in Russia, uh, staging protests in a small town in Siberia. The uh, fo security forces have come down on them, arrested them, beat them, and their notion was, well, there's a solution here. Uh, the solution is to take dolls, to dress them as protesters, and to put them in the center of town. Now, everybody knows a protest is taking place, and the kids are saying to the security forces, you know, if you want to arrest these dolls, uh, you're welcome to. If you want to beat these dolls, you're welcome to. <laughs> But the point has been made, there's a protest in effect. So this is a French film company that decided, why do theater in theater? I'm not dying, I'm this is their day image day. Project, projected from a car on, uh, on, the, on the surfaces of Paris. A magnificent way of, of breaking down that siloed isolation of the theater from the... Uh, from the city. This is a do-it-yourself memorial. I was on Brooklyn Bridge uh, in December. I was walking across, and those of you who've been on the bridge know that people are taking these locks. They're locking them onto the bridge. First, they engrave them with some message, some memorial, and they leave them there. So it's like do-it-yourself memorial. It's like privatizing a public function. It's saying to the state, uh, you do your memorial stuff, you create these, you know, these giant, here's he's sitting in a great memorial to this, the memory of Rockefeller. We wish to create our own memorials and we will occupy public space by our own efforts to do so. When Tony B Blair came out with a book, uh, this book, <coughs> called A Journey, 
uh, to kind of remember his place in office. People who hated what he had done as the Prime Minister of Britain said. Um, as the books came into the bookstore, they said there's a way of making a point about who this man is and, and what his regime, regime was like, and they began to relocate these books in the bookstore. So in this case, there was a section called Serial Killers, so they made a certain point about Tony Blair by relocating his, his book. So again, it's a gesture that's virtually free, it's an imaginative, it's opportunistic, uh, and extraordinarily effective, right? It was a way of fighting Tony Blair's efforts to control his own press in a very effective way. Here somebody has taken an old AT&T, um, uh, um, what do you call it, installation, and, and they've turned it into a library. Here somebody has turned, uh, has created sea bombs and they're re, uh, re-gardening, they're refurbishing London with uh, so anyhow, that's the notion. Culturematics are tiny experiments, cheap, cheerful, clever, and opportunistic. I hope you'll make one. I hope you'll make this contribution to the explosion of creativity. Uh, and please uh, it, uh, come to the website and let me know what culturematic you're making. Uh, more instructions you can find at this book. Great. Thanks a million.